Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, our panel, uh, Interdisciplinarity in Digital Scholarship. I believe that both of these topics that we will be talking about today, interdisciplinarity on the one hand and digital scholarship on the other, and the intersection between them will be highly important for the entire conference of future education. We will have four presentations today. Uh, we will try to keep each of them uh, up to 10 minutes. And I propose that we first go with all the presentations and then take questions at the end. So if you have a question during uh, someone's talk and presentation, please write down those questions. And then uh, at the end, we will hopefully have about 10 or 15 minutes for all those questions and the discussion. So uh, our first presenters will be colleagues from uh, the Ethnographic Museum in Belgrade, Bojan Djokic and Ivan Maksimovic will be talking about future perspectives in connecting sciences and humanities. Please. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, apologize for the short uh, minute changes. Uh, Ms. Tola Kantic Popovic was kind enough to um, well, trust, us, trust in us to give this presentation, and uh, Ms. Anna Novakovic was unable to, to uh, give the talk, so I will be uh, instead of her. And uh, we will uh, try to give a brief overview of the efforts that we made at the Ethnographic Museum in Belgrade to establish interdisciplinary <coughs> educational activities and perspectives of utilizing digital media to enhance their potential. So I would like to thank also the organizers uh, for um, the opportunity for us to present this modest contribution. Now, firstly, I would like to um, give a brief introduction regarding the Ethnographic Museum in Belgrade. It was uh, founded in 1901, as you can see, and it has now more than 50,000 artifacts and uh, most of which are related to Serbian culture, especially traditional Serbian culture, because the mission of the museum from the onset was to um, collect these artifacts and to um, collect the knowledge regarding the traditional culture, which was slowly disappearing even at that time. So um, this was, uh, this was uh, the, the mission that was for a very long, for, for the most part of the museum's history, its core, uh, core mission. Now since uh, 2003, we offer um, a program called Child and Tradition, which operates within the museum and uh, th as a project, it covers workshops and other programs directed towards children in order to foster knowledge of and interest towards cultural heritage. The project has uh, striven towards interdisciplinarity since its inception. And this is evident in at least two ways, as you, can, as you can see here. So firstly, we cooperate with professionals from other fields in order to enhance the main goal and the core message of the project, which is to educate and stimulate interest in cultural heritage. The second form of interdisciplinarity that we also foster is connecting ethnology with other disciplines to make learning more fun efficient and creative, as well as to contribute to a more complex and holistic understanding of the world and its phenomena. Now, a good example of this uh, first form of interdisciplinarity is the play, uh, the, A Christmas Dream, a photo of which you can see here, which was uh, staged in the early 2000s. Now, the story revolves around a pair of contemporary children who get magically transported into the on Christmas Eve into the past of their grand, great, uh, grandparents who show them how they celebrated this holiday. And the play mobilized the help of uh, theater professionals, um, uh, stage director, uh, playwright, composers, set and costume designers, and even professional actors. All of this was in order to ensure that the uh, idea behind the play is clearly communicated. So it was important for us to um, have someone to associate with someone who knows the medium of the stage play in order to make our message more clear. Now, moreover, all of our programs are developed with the help of child education <coughs> experts who ensure that all the pro programs, including workshops, 
uh, closely follow school curricula. Now, however, we would today like to uh, primarily talk about the other form of interdisciplinarity, which is represented in the uh, form of two workshops carried out at the Ethnographic Museum since 2015. Uh, the one is called By Grain Per Grain, and the other is Visible and Invisible About the Egg. Uh, these two workshops were conducted in association with colleagues from um, the Faculty of Chemistry, University of Belgrade, uh, including, and most instrumentally, Mr. Bojan Jokic, who will now um, take the floor and tell us something more about these uh, workshops in detail. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And my part here is to talk about our two workshops. And first of that workshops is, as uh, Ivan said, by grain per grain. And uh, oh, what was uh, what was the cause of this workshop? The first part of this workshop was uh, learning about customs related with our ritual breads and is performed by curators of ethnographic museum in Belgrade. And the second part is chemistry part where the kids uh, have uh, opportunity uh, to do examination of main ingredients of that and, uh, and uh, to get to know bread making process uh, more clearly. And as you can see, uh, these are some pictures from uh, that workshop, that first workshop. Our second workshop that, uh, that we're doing together uh, is visible and invisible about the egg. And uh, it's about uh, our tradition, our Easter tradition. And first part, uh, and that's ethnological part of this workshop, is about painting the eggs in a traditional way. And the second part, uh, or the chemical part of uh, this workshop, is examination of eggshell properties and uh, egg contents. Uh, on this workshop, uh, students age 9 to 11 uh, ha have opportunity, first opportunity to do science experiments uh, and uh, to get to know more about lab equipment that we use, uh, such as test tubes, Erlenmeyer flask, or beakers. And they're all doing uh, that, simple, uh, that simple experiment uh, with our instructions. And these are photos that represent first, uh, for, uh, first part or ethnological part uh, of, of uh, this workshop. And on the second part, we can, uh, we can see students uh, that, uh, that work, uh, that, uh, work uh, on laboratory equipment. Uh, this uh, we represent our worksheet that's prepared for all students. And uh, on the first page, on this page, uh, uh, we, uh, we prepared a cultural heritage uh, page. And uh, you can see here questions and uh, proverbs that we have in our Serbian traditions, and also a legend uh, and stories about the egg. And second part is about, OK, uh, thank you. Uh, and second part is about experiments that uh, uh, that children uh, do on our workshops. Uh, how, does, uh, uh, how does it work? Uh, students work in groups of five or six students are in one group, and uh, these, uh, these uh, workshops are managed by curators and students of chemistry, and uh, questions that we are asking them uh, and that are connected with experimental work are when the flower turns blue, what is the bait for yeast, what compound is formed when yeast is active, or is there water in egg? And uh, when they do all our experiments, they get to know the answers on all these questions. Uh, the research involved two, uh, 240 third, uh, third grade students and uh, from seven primary schools. Uh, uh, and seven primary schools teachers, and students and teachers emphasize these fo following statements. The concept of, of workshop in, is interesting because students uh, search for answers while doing experimental work. That's the first part. And second, the students are encouraged to make different assumptions and to communicate 
all pros and cons during uh, the work of experiments. So uh, now I will give the word to my colleague Ivan to, to tell uh, something about educational game uh, of ethnographic museum. So in order to fulfill this uh, potential of interdisciplinarity, we started developing an, uh, the idea of a web game for children, which, is, uh, which would be hosted on the museum webpage. And the title of the game is uh, Walk Through the Ethnographic Museum, Life in Serbia 150 Years Ago. So it is, uh, well, the concept behind it is life in the past in Serbia, and uh, children are invited to explore the museum in order to learn more about its activities, but also to discover something more about the past and um, to uh, deepen their horizons of knowledge. Now, we believe that uh, digital media offers two possibilities that are simply not available elsewhere and that can help us really to fulfill these potentials. Now, uh, firstly, it enables a potentially endless space for material which, uh, um, which, which uh, is related to this interdisciplinarity and um, uh, material that, that comes from different areas of knowledge. Now, also the potentials for connectivity are endless, so we can in that way broaden the scope of any top topic. And this is perfect for interdisciplinary approaches because we can easily link materials and topics that are uh, of different disciplines, link them together and present them in one place. For instance, we can enrich the story of uh, food culture in Serbia in the past with um, examples and uh, experiments uh, in food chemistry. Now, it is not difficult to imagine other potentials that can also include other disciplines, uh, whether they come from natural sciences or um, social sciences as well. Now, secondly, visual interface, um, the animations, the effects, and so on, are also potentially limitless. And uh, just like the play that we discussed earlier, it is, uh, it is able to enchant and involve players in the setting and um, make them enter the world of the museum uh, in a way that was uh, maybe difficult to, to understand if they were just simply visitors. So in this way, it will sensitize them and prepare them for the visit, for an actual visit to the museum and the face-to-face -face interaction with material objects by transporting them into this world, into this world of past and by engaging with their uh, imagination. I really apologize for interrupting this very interesting <laughs> presentation, but we are two minutes over time, so if you could just please wrap it up. Thank you. I was, I was actually um, reaching the end. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the attention and the opportunity to pre oh, present okay. this. Okay, that was it. Sorry. Then. Thank you again. And so uh, our next speaker is uh, Andreas Rippel, who is the head of the Federal Center of E-Education in Austria, Vienna. And he will be talking about e-education strategies and impact of Austria's digital agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, my name is Andreas Rippel. And um, I am head of a network uh, consisting of 2,600 schools in Austria at the moment. Uh, we have a total of 6,000 schools, so we're going towards half of all schools. And uh, it's a project uh, that uh, is not only uh, vertic uh, horizontal, but also vertical, which means that uh, we start at primary level and going all the way up to upper secondary level of all schools. And uh, the main title of our project is to uh, get schools uh, digital on, each, on any aspect you can think of, starting with the uh, uh, digital competencies of uh, teachers and going all the way to the development of the organizations by uh, looking at school management um, aspects <coughs> and trying to get schools uh, involved. But the main title of uh, this initiative is how to develop uh, teachers' digital competencies. So actually, um, we have uh, quite a large budget, which is just in place for teachers to do further education on the digital uh, agenda. Um, just uh, to relate back, relate back to uh, the person uh, that I am, I am um, also an entrepreneur, so I have a company with uh, 10 uh, software develop developers, 
And I know how hard it is uh, to uh, find a uh, new workforce that is specialized and open to flexibility and uh, changes. And uh, the most important part, I'm still a teacher. I teach at a pedagogical university college. I work with students there, but also I teach at a business school. And this is, for me, always a good connection to the reality. And uh, I think this is uh, also an, an important part in our network work where uh, we succeeded in involving different communities that had formed in the past 10 to 15 years and it's not a nice word to say but assimilated them one into one uh, big network and uh, the numbers uh, that you see is that uh, schools that uh, enter this network uh, they start with a so-called member status that's nothing more than filling in a web form but then they can excel and develop and be, uh, have a sort of expert status of a certain time and uh, we have 1,700 uh, member schools in the system at the moment, 800 that have documented their, uh, their uh, agenda and on the digital aspects, and um, 105, which are so-called Expert Plus, which are the ones that have established uh, using the digital media and everything uh, throughout the whole school for a long period of time. Um, Involved school types are uh, going or starting at primary level, and uh, what we do is we don't emphasize on uh, using digital aspects at primary level, but we emphasize on logical structures, on coding, on problem-solving uh, capabilities. And when uh, we hear that uh, the crisis of uni uh, the, about the crisis of universities, I stress that this starts uh, a lot earlier. And uh, what we have to take a good look at is on how we can help teachers change their way of teaching so that will be positive for the students. And so in the primary schools, we try to focus on how to develop those problem solving skills. And then starting with uh, secondary uh, level, uh, we uh, focus on using a digital aspect and for uh, also uh, to use them in a very responsible way. For example, we have uh, uh, one initiative called Safer Internet that does nothing else but shows about sort of the dangers uh, of uh, aspects of social media and so on, but also tries to promote the positive sides of using uh, uh, technology. Uh, what do this, uh, our schools work with? Uh, they uh, have different uh, aspects that they concentrate on. And if you see, the bottom line is using digital media and classroom work, but also school development. And this is very important because this is an issue. If the whole organization goes towards this direction, then uh, it is likely that all colleagues working in the school will also adapt that. Uh, we, have, uh, we are in a big OER initiative. We heard that two days back that open educational resources are very important. Also, our main focus on open source as well. And the teachers produce content that uh, they get paid once and then share with others based upon Creative Commons licensing. And um, this is uh, very widely used. We have something implemented. It's another tool that uh, it's called DigiCheck, which does the following. And it's, it allows teachers to check in an anonymous way, their digital competences. And uh, there's a self-reflection part and a sort of testing part, and that matches, and then uh, that's part of the reality. And then there are different programs that uh, teachers can uh, try to uh, develop the further in form of further education if there is lack uh, in one certain digital area. And this testing is also done um, at secondary level for students. Uh, we have something like big data, which means that uh, we have aggregated uh, statistics. The big focus and um, uh, advantage of Austria is that uh, we are so small that we have one centralized strategy. It's a different situation, for example, in Germany where they have 16 educational systems. So we can really focus and it uh, shows that it has impact. We have developed a quality matrix, another tool for schools to uh, identify the position where they're in and how development uh, is possible. We focus a lot on the self-reflection um, aspect and have um, tools that even help schools to develop a digital concept uh, for this aspect. Uh, one uh, big issue is that we have, uh, of course, schools, uh, they need consulting. And so we have a network of 70 uh, persons throughout Austrian 
uh, Austria uh, regionally and also throughout the school levels that support these schools. And what you see here is a list of around 40 activities that schools can document what they do digitally. And this is then reflected with this network of 70 people. And uh, if they acknowledge uh, one of these activities, then they gain points. Schools gain points. And depending on class sizes and size of the school, they then at a certain uh, time have enough points to gain or to have this expert status. And from this moment on, they access our budgets for further education and uh, uh, projects on the digital behalf. And so this is a sort of a gamifi gamification concept that has been integrated, which works quite well. We have a statistic dashboard for our 70 coordinators that show how the schools uh, are on their way and how to help them in a positive way. Uh, we have a consultant's database, which means that uh, we have different technologies and uh, people stand for different technologies and schools decide which basic uh, technology they uh, want to work with and then they have the consultants that help them out. Of course, we also refer to uh, the models that you probably all know, uh, which try to uh, uh, emphasize on how to use digital uh, agenda in classroom, starting from having to know uh, the technical part to be able to judge when it is uh, uh, it makes sense to have um, uh, technology uh, in place uh, for learning processes as well as the dark stool uh, model that also reflects towards the social cultural effects and the summer model which identifies on how to use uh, technology in uh, digitalized uh, uh, didactic courses. One of the main fields of focus at the moment is the school management because uh, schools work differently than companies and we're actually uh, communities of practice and experts and experts are relate to their subject and not to their organization. And this is a big challenge for uh, the school management itself but uh, we have tr we're trying to help them and identify the problems and um, help them by showing them that clear goals are needed and that uh, the development, uh, the digital development of colleagues and trying to be a team are essential aspects, which means that um, school management should always be a form of a role model, have aspects of participation, integrate new technologies, have a shared vision and put the we into the foreground. We've done piloting uh, with all different technologies and uh, have shown that uh, there are entry points available for everyone. But uh, actually, it's never about uh, the technology itself, but how to use it. And uh, if you just take a look at the learning process, it's always it's input, the student processes, there's output, there might be an iteration, and at uh, the end, there is a grade, there is a reflection uh, of the situation. And if you take the teacher's perspective, it's trying to fulfill the curriculum on one side, uh, individual, individualization aspects, but also addressing future competencies. And sorry, this does not look quite right, but uh, just to give you the impression, um, Google and Microsoft, they have uh, tried to focus and research what are the competencies that are needed for future employees for their companies. And uh, even uh, Google has revised uh, these uh, different aspects for future. Uh, and uh, my question, my provocative question is here, relating to universities, if uh, the students uh, that you work with address these different competences, because that's what we try to emphasize on during schoolwork. And this is something totally different than what we have done. The problem that we have at the moment is that we have 120,000 teachers in Austria and uh, this might relate to about 10,000. And the question is how to address the rest. Uh, the conclusion is on this page, artificial intelligence is getting better so uh, we have to find ways on how to work with, uh, with that on a hum humanistic uh, way aside. We have no, no monopoly on knowledge anymore. And so we have to see technology as an enabler, find new didactics, and uh, collaborate. That's the most important part. And these are all part sets of 21st century skills that relate to the school system as well as the university system. And uh, so actually it's uh, not about technology, but the change, pedagogy, and uh, future skills. 
and uh, focus on the interdisciplinary. We're trying to do this. Thank you. Andres, uh, our next speaker is Milena Stankovic. Uh, she is a professor at the Faculty of Elect Electronic Engineering, University of Niš in Serbia. And Milena will be talking about educational challenges related to uh, data sciences across disciplines. Okay, since I'm coming from technical field, I would like to speak uh, about uh, data science engineers or data mining engineers which is one of most promising profession to, today because uh, data science is uh, one of the main part of artificial intelligence. Uh, and also, this area is a nice example where uh, we need uh, multidisciplinarity in education at high level. Okay, main topic in uh, my presentation will be data. Data which are everywhere around us. Today we are all connected to the internet and uh, we are uh, uh, communicate uh, by using mobile devices and mobile phones. People, businesses and devices have all become data factories that are pumping out incredible uh, amount of information to the web each day. Uh, now we are living in the world which is uh, different, not comparing with a uh, hundred year ago, not comparing with 50 years ago, but comparing with 10 years ago or five years ago. Uh, we are living in a world when we have exponential growing of information which are available and also of exponential changes in the life. For example, 90% of all information at the internet has been created since 2016. 19%. That uh, means exponential growing of information. According to the prediction of International Data Corporation, next year the total data on the internet will be 45 zettabytes. Zettabytes is a huge number. This is a number with uh, tw 21 zero outside one. That's incredible. Uh, today, this big data on the internet, for this big data on the internet is uh, guilty. It's possible to say internet of things. What means internet of things? The term generally refers to the scenario where network connectivity and computing capability extend to objects, sensors, and everyday items which are not considered uh, as computer. That's our ordinary engines, uh, devices, sensors, and uh, so on. Those devices generate, exchange, and consume data with uh, minimal human intervention. They communicate uh, between uh, them. This uh, big quantity of data is only one side of the problem that we have. Uh, the other side of the problem is the quality of the data. Uh, traditionally, we have programs, we have algorithms to work with structured data, data which are well pro uh, prepared for processing, for example, this kind of data are uh, data in databases, SQL databases, transactional data, or matrices uh, and trees in uh, scientific application. However, on the internet today, we have 
a lot of unstructured data, data which are not prepared, prepared for uh, processing. Those data are prepared for human consumption. For example, this kind of data are um, different text, text from emails, from blogs, from comments, and so on, then images, audio and video files, also different kind of machine data. For example, each application has uh, uh, log files, like web log files, application log files, uh, and also, there is a lot of data nowadays from mobile phones. Those kind of data are not prepared pro for processing. And then we have situation when we have uh, big data, a lot of data, and a lot of uh, bad quality data for processing. And from other side, we need new technique, technique, new methodologies, new algorithm from, for processing this kind of data to extract some information which are inside of those data. There is a lot of available information in those data and we need tools, algorithm to extract information from those data. One, one of the way to solve this problem is data science or data mining. And here I will mention machine learning as one of uh, uh, technique used in, in uh, data science. Machine <coughs> learning today is used in two different forms. One is supervised machine learning, and the other is unsupervised machine learning. In case of supervised machine learning, we have a set of uh, raw data, big collection of data, and also we have a set of label uh, relating to the class, uh, classes of those data. This information about label usually is done uh, by supervisor by human beings and by using uh, part of data prepared for this uh, processing and uh, those label, we are creating the model of uh, the engine which will generate uh, corresponding classes of the data. One part of uh, the input data is used for uh, verification, and when the model is verified, then we have tool which is possible to use uh, in real time for classification of this kind of data according to uh, 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 their properties. For example, this concept today is used is in the big project for uh, autonomous uh, car. They are using data from the past to define the engine which will uh, drive kind, uh, a car autonomously. The second machine learning technique is unsupervised uh, learning, when, uh, which is usu usually used for clustering. Here, there is no information about classes of the data, but we are using uh, some function on similarity or some definition of distance between object and uh, by using of those uh, definition, we are classify the data. This concept is uh, convenient for use in uh, real time. There is a lot of area when, where data science is used, for example, in medicine, medical image processing, genomic and uh, genetic uh, creation of drug, in business for uh, defining strategies, but uh, uh, prediction of time series and so on. For example, in uh, economy, in business, uh, today are very popular recommendation system where uh, the data from the past 
are used to predict how, uh, how the customer will uh, react in the future for some product. One new area in this domain is industrial data science. And uh, this concept today is used for uh, quality control, anatomy, uh, anomaly detection, cost reduction, and this concept today is the uh, basis of the uh, concept of the fourth industrial revolution. First was related to steam power, the second to electrical engine, the next uh, to automatization and computer. And uh, uh, next uh, is not only application of new, te new technology, it is a concept of changing of the business model. Uh, new factory, they are not producing only the good, they are uh, providing services, customized services related to those goods. Mm -hmm. For example, services to control the quali quality of the machine. Okay, for the end few words about uh, education of uh, data engineer. Data engineer uh, uh, need to be educated in different fields. One big part is mathematics, is statistic, machine learning, classification, clustering, time series prediction, dimensionality redu reduction, the theory of optimization and so on. The second part is software engineering, programming, programming languages, tools for work with, uh, for parallel computing, for work with big data and so on. But that is not enough uh, for presentation of the result because they are not uh, explicit, they are implicit. They need to be good presenter uh, they need to use a uh, tool for visualization, for analysis. Uh, from one side, they need to be a uh, new kind of arts. Also, to understand different problems in different areas, they need to have a good uh, communication skills. Uh, they have to be good in analyzing problem and finding good solution for solving those problems. Uh, fortunate, unfortunately, our education is not well prepared for this kind of uh, uh, engineer to, to teach this kind of engineers. We have, for example, here in Serbia, we have good mathematician from one side, from other side, we have good uh, software engineers, but we need connection of those two professions with uh, communication skills, with uh, skills for visualization and presentation. And because of that, uh, we have to change uh, our education system. Uh, needed ed education system, uh, uh, have to be open and flexible, open and flexible, and generally, it's possible to say this uh, education system um, have to prepare young generation for exponential growing of technology and exponential changing in the life. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. And I will be the last speaker for today. And as Milana was talking about the future of education, uh, ed educating data engineers, I will actually be talking about uh, some efforts to educate scholars in the humanities and social sciences. And in talking about that, I actually like to start with this quote, 
which says I went to sleep one day a cultural critic and woke the next metamorphosis into a data processor. I think that this uh, quote captures the feelings of many scholars in the humanities and social sciences who perceive that transition toward di digital scholarship and interdisciplinarity that it brings as a sudden and profound transformation that influences the very core of their professional identities, practices, and expertise. Now, my work uh, over the past several uh, years and still ongoing has explored this transition of the humanities and social sciences towards digital scholarship and increasing uh, interdisciplinarity. Uh, what I would like to do here is to share some of the results that summarize findings of several studies I conducted at 23 educational research and funding institutions in the United States and in Europe, uh, and which involved more than 250 participants. Uh, this research included both theoretical and action-oriented work, as I will elaborate throughout the presentation. And the the question that I want to focus on here is how can we build interdisciplinary digital research capacity in the humanities and social sciences? In particular, I will focus on two aspects of capacity building relevant for digital scholarship and also for this conference. Uh, the first of those, uh, is, uh, uh, of, of those aspects is knowledge capacity. Uh, because the precondition for benefiting from digital research tools and methods is mastering those resources in a systematic, learned manner. Yet, when I ask my respondents, scholars in the humanities and social sciences, where do they learn how to use the digital research methods and tools, the undivided response is, can you guess? Nowhere. Nowhere, exactly, on my own. So, as we hear, see in this quote, uh, one of the associate professor of linguistics with whom I spoke says, I ask around, it's just like word of mouth, I sor sort of bump into it or a colleague will shoot me an email. It's not organized and strategic at all. So, scholars in the humanities and social sciences are often aware of methodological and uh, met, uh, epistemological benefits of digital research tools and methods, but they are not in a position to acquire relevant skills and knowledge. As one of the respondents put it, I haven't used technology in my research in a pervasive way to really, really think about epistemological issues. I'm not opposed to using technology to analyze, but I haven't had a chance to, uh, to learn it. An important reason for researchers' inability to develop digital research skills is a structure of disciplinary incentives and rewards. My respondent explains, for instance, that when a, tr a training session on digital research tools and methods is organized at their university, hardly any of the faculty, especially tenure-track faculty, attend. And this is talking about, this is the first impediment to uh, developing uh, knowledge uh, competency, which is the structure uh, of uh, the incentives and rewards. As this assistant professor of art, art history says, we are not rewarding for doing that, for actually developing competencies and learning how to use dig digital research tools and methods. What we are rewarded for is publishing and going to one of those sessions where they would learn about digital methods takes away time from our publishing. So there is a lot of uh, resistance. Um, another important uh, impediment is that currently prevailing organizational strategy places digital scholarships in libraries and other spaces outside the central disciplinary workflows. Uh, such educational initiatives often uh, lack uh, clear strategy and focus on technical features and skills rather than on field-specific research questions and uh, needs. Instead, uh, what we need is uh, humanists and social sciences favor and really best learn in practice when instruction is closely integrated to their area of study and when it unfolds un organically through collaboration with uh, colleagues. Uh, this was the approach of our uh, work in the Alpha Lab or Humanities Lab project at the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences in Amsterdam, which focused on integrated humanities and social science knowledge, experience, data, and tools. Uh, our aim was to develop a network uh, and a set of prototype tools for research in the humanities and social sciences. 
Uh, I was part of the Interface Lab research group, which, as the name suggests, served as the interface between different areas of expertise, knowledge, and data, making sure that the tools are developed through successful interdisciplinary collaboration. Uh, now, digital research tools we developed included tools for text analysis, historical GIS, and historical population uh, counts. Uh, in addition to developing tools, one of our main goals was to develop a safe space where sc our scholars across disciplines could freely ask, experiment, make mistakes, get frustrated in our interdisciplinary work. We discussed various challenges encountered in the interdisciplinary practice and facilitated scholars' sensibility to new ways of working and approaching objects of inquiry. Here is what one of our Alpha Labs colleagues said about her experience in that regard. And I hope that this uh, sound will work. If not, we will just skip over this uh, slide. Uh, in the uh, collaboration with the software developers, um, each time when they showed me their newly developed functionalities, um, um, they made me see new possibilities to ask new questions uh, to the material and I um, uh, got back to them and asked them even to build even more functionalities because um, I, I didn't see the possibilities before but only during the process of developing this digital tool. Now, uh, we also assisted scholars to articulate their discipline-specific methods and research objects, as well as to develop the com common vocabulary, which was needed but not always easy to reach. Here is what another of our colleagues, this time from the IT department, said uh, about that. Oops. Sometimes you talk about uh, a topic and you have a completely different notion than the other person has. For example, one time I was talking with social scientists about questions and variables that, that they measure and we had a long discussion and it appeared that they have a completely different notion on, on variables than I, from an ICT background, have. And so, and you can always have a, have a laugh about such mistakes. You're, you will always be forgiven, luckily. So that's quite interesting for me. So that was uh, an example of one of those safe spaces that I mentioned that we were trying to, to create. And I will tr uh, try to go briefly. I, uh, uh, I'm aware that I'm probably running out of time, seriously. So uh, in addition and closely related to building knowledge capacity is the second important area of capacity building I want to talk to ab about, which is technical capacity. And building technical capacity is important because digital scholarship is not just supported by technology, but actually constituted through it. Because research tools shape both the object of inquiry and the ways of knowing it. Therefore, uh, scholars' involvement in digital research tool development is a profound question concerning the kinds of research practices and ways of knowing the digital tools uh, enable and promote. It is really, it is not uh, the question about the configuration of technology that shapes both how, how what uh, we know and what we can know. However, when it comes to influence that scholars in the humanities and social sciences have on the tool development, the results are pretty similar with both commercial and academically developed tools, minimal to no influence. As this professor of history says, we s seem to have no influence at all because no one talks to us or asks us or listens to us. Um, a common comment coming from the IT side is the scholars in the humanities and social sciences either do not know what they want in a tool or they don't have the vocabulary and frame of reference to explain uh, what they want. So this is where the issue of knowledge capacity arises again as crucially important. Scholars in the humanities and social sciences need to build knowledge capacity that would enable them to influence the development of re digital research tools and resources. As this scholar put it, unless humanists and social scientists take seriously the value of their own contributions and perspectives on the nature of knowledge, digital tools and resources will be built without those values. It is not why the humanities and social sciences matter, but how do they matter uh, that we need to put uh, forward. And 
taking seriously those values of humanities and social sciences contribution on the development of digital research tools and resources was the focus of the second action-oriented work that I wanted to mention here. That was the power of words in traditional European cultures uh, project, uh, which connected teams in nine uh, countries. And we focused on digitizing words of power. Words of power are curses, blessings, and, and so on. So now, um, our work centered on thinking through how those various sources to be digitized would be used in research, what kind of questions would be generated. So we wanted to do more than simply digitize in the usual sense of the term. Our goal was to build a digital resource shaped by research practices reflecting humanists and social sciences ways of working that closely link data with interpretation. We wanted the values of the humanities and social sciences to be built and reflected in this digital resource. So in conclusion, theoretical and action-oriented work focused on knowledge and technical capacity building is vital for the overall value building and supporting uh, transition of the humanities and social sciences towards digital scholarship and increasing interdisciplinarity. And I thank you very much for your, your attention and I welcome any questions that you might have for all four presentations. <laughs> thank you. this 
And we see from year to year there is a development. Huh? But uh, of course we're not there yet. I have another question to me just a very simple question. You mentioned, you mentioned the verification of the market. Why did you mention the validation? Because I understand that verification is the model that asks what I think is the right to do. My, I, I, I might be wrong. So I need to compare the model with the real world. Yes. It's what I call yeah. validation. We are doing exactly that. You do, you, you do that or not? We, we are doing exactly that. We have a set of data with the uh, uh, label of the classes, but the system generated the own label of the classes and we are comparing the result with the real uh, label and if uh, we have a good percentage of good answers that the system is good. There is, uh, this is a standard tool for uh, uh, validation of uh, supervised learning. We are comparing uh, known classes done by supervisor with the result of the system. And then uh, we are deciding if the system is good. In some case, we need 99% uh, of the... Uh, yes, statistical. In some case, for example, in uh, natural language processing is, n is not possible, or image classification is not possible to have so good a result. It is enough to have 70 or 80 percent of uh, uh, validi or validity of those uh, results. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question there. Uh, no, this is actually, so my studies were conducted mostly in the United States and in different European countries. It is actually one of the most effective ways. And I just wanted to clarify, so my research focused really on how scholars, so I'm not talking about students, I'm talking about professors. I mostly talk to professors uh, and researchers in different research institutions. So once you already completed your schooling, what happens then? And you still want to develop that kind of, those kinds of skills to use digital tools, to use digital resources, methods, and also to be able to influence the development of those resources. So how do you do that? How do you learn it? So that, and that becomes almost impossible because of all those different impediments that I was mentioning, one being reward system. We are simply not rewarded for doing that. You know what we tell our students who are on tenure track, you first do your thing, something that you will get tenure for, and then focus on the digital as much as you want. So those are some of the, yeah, some of the problems and impediments that we, we have. Yes. Excuse me if I may just, we had a question there before, so if, would it be okay? 
and then I will come back. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh -huh. Correct. And uh, many of those uh, Shivaya Lit are assistant professors. They need to earn tenure. And uh, they want to know naturally how their investment Correct. will reflect returns. And uh, I think in humanities, many people are not sure how much they should invest in developing new tools, new skills. Even we know. You're absolutely right. Uh, it is a big investment of, of time and uh, your competencies and, and things like that. It is not related just to developing those skills. It is also, as I mentioned, what is it that you will pay attention to? Uh, what kind of, so one of the problems that we had in those, those interdisciplinary teams was what will be the final output because people from the IT side want a database or something like that that they will be rewarded for. People in the humanities will want a peer-reviewed article, and, and so on. So how do we get those shared articles? And I just want to mention that it is not, because the point is just as you mentioned, uh, uh, scholars who are on tenure track. And you will see that there are actually a lot of similarities across disciplines. We talk often about data sharing. And we sometimes uh, assume that scholars in the humanities, the social sciences, would be more proprietary, which is actually not true. Uh, the results of this study, uh, at least, show that scholars in the sciences are equally proprietary when it comes to their data that they need to uh, publish first and to get reward in their tenure track process. So we are simply not rewarding, you know, we are not rewarding people for how many other scholars reused your data set and qu quoted your data set and, and so on. We are simply not rewarding for that. Big problem. Yes. That's Milana. Yes, uh -huh. yes, I mentioned that. Could you, could you put uh, some thoughts about psychology on that? Uh, no, this is exactly mathematical relation between data, but uh, interpretation of data must yes. be uh, maybe psychology and. Uh, because the more sophisticated finance. Yes, they need uh, non expert knowledge in the area. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's because we need uh, these uh, additional skills because it's not easy to extract knowledge from the data. We have some result, but how we will exp interpret the results and how the result will be accepted for the expert in the other area, this is a separate part of the of the story and it's not not easy to Thank do you. that and we uh, i apologize we are out of time i see two more hands uh, i would ask if you could just ask your questions and maybe we can have them answered outside would that be okay Mm -hmm. uh, what would fight the case? Uh, and my question is, have you given thought to at least the fact that whilst we need time to learn how to use these tools, we need equally time to learn how to do interdisciplinary 
Yeah, absolutely. You, you're absolutely right. We had one more, uh, sorry, uh, we, we question. had one more question. Just a very follow up in terms of uh, when you do data, isn't the, the psychology, the preferences are revealed into the data because the data comes from people's behavior. Just wondering whether it's being built into that data that then you use to put that for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much and let's continue this conversation. Thank you.